Without doubt, he is the most experienced head of state in power in the world today. Even his critics have described him as a gifted man with a talent for power and an infinite capacity for work. He is, above all things, a man with a burning desire to master the nearly inscrutable processes of executive leadership in a modern, complex, and changing world. For President Lyndon Johnson, the hours and days of each month are filled with the diversities of challenge and activity that even the rank outsider associates with his office. Yet, clearly at the core of this activity, this mosaic of time and burning energy, the winds of crisis and sudden change are inalterably present. And they can, without warning, suddenly begin to emerge. In 1966, President Johnson and his family came home to the hills of Southwest Texas and their LBJ ranch. Here for a few days, they would take up the needed luxury of a change of pace. Here among family and a few close friends, the obligations to Washington formality quickly began to slip away. The first family was home. Queen of Seasons in Southwest Texas are the months of April and May. If they are kind, great white thunderheads roll in from the Gulf, leaving behind a profusion of wild flowers that will bloom deep into the summer. To a man like author biographer Jim Bishop, sitting in a field of wild flowers in the midst of a brown and sunburned country which has known more than its share of drought and deprivation can be slightly paradoxical. But Lyndon Baines Johnson was born to a land of extremes. And over the years, he's made no secret of the fact that the hard-earned freedom that the men of this land have made for themselves has been a constant source of inspiration to him in his 35 years in the nation's capital.
Over the years, the president has become his own best judge of the kind of schedule he can maintain. He knows keenly when it's time to stop and rest. It's then that he comes home. But he is very rarely alone. News of his comings and goings is in constant demand throughout the news capitals of the world. It's the same swiftness of news gathering in today's world that the president uses to satisfy his own constant need to be informed. The lines of communication to him are always open, whether he's in Texas on a June weekend or in the White House. On Saturday evening, June 4th, President and Mrs. Johnson left the LBJ ranch for a short helicopter ride into Austin. For the Johnson family, Austin, Texas has its fond memories. It was there on September 12, 1934, while he was attending a meeting of the Texas Railroad Commission, that Lyndon Johnson met Miss Claudia Taylor of Karnak, Texas. Even then, her family and friends called her Lady Bird. It was also there on April 10, 1937, while he was confined to a hospital bed, that President Johnson learned of his first real victory in big time politics. Now, on a night in June of 1966, he came back to Austin and sat in the audience at the University of Texas as his daughter Linda received her bachelor's degree in history. The president's political ambitions had been spawned here in Texas in the midst of a Great Depression. During the early years, he was both a partial creator and full participant in the turn of this country toward a changing and more responsible social discipline. A social discipline that would not only break the Great Depression, but also give early promise to an even stronger America. For Lyndon Baines Johnson, the memory of this early promise was a lasting thing. In time, it gave birth to one of his fondest dreams, the challenge of the Great Society. But in June of 1966, the administration of the Great Society was engaged in, or faced with, a myriad of besetting problems. Farm income was at its highest level in years, yet many farmers were pictured as unhappy at what they supposedly felt was a White House effort to blame them for the high cost of living. Inflation and the problem of keeping labor shortages from producing exorbitant wage demands had become a daily topic for many editorial writers. Despite the fact that he had held four more official press conferences than his predecessor had in a comparable period of time, word was also being heard about a communications gap between the president and the people. The problems of integration, big business and unions, a possible crippling airline strike, and the coming of Medicare all loomed on the horizon. But major among them all was the war in Vietnam. Despite these overriding problems, it is perhaps interesting to note that President Johnson took a large portion of time during his first three days back from Texas to talk to that certain segment of the population from whom he had always drawn strength, the young. To his presidential scholars, he would issue congratulations and a word for the future. So this afternoon, I bring you more than a medallion to mark your honor. I bring you the pride and the hope of a nation that cherishes excellence and commitment and that has never needed your kind of excellence and commitment more than it needs it right now. So we look to you for the qualities of national greatness. Your country looks to your character and to your conviction and to your individual commitment to the ideals of democracy and to the works of democracy, without which the ideals are just so many dime store decorations. nearly 1,000 students representing the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, 
an organization that he has always been close to, President Johnson would present the challenges of public service. Who will work to improve our inadequate schools and our libraries? Who will build the parks and clear the slum? Who will clean up the countryside and restore our natural resources? Who will patrol the streets and operate the hospitals and the rest home? Who will staff social welfare agencies, teach in the college, and plan the new town? Who will lead the way in beautifying the cities and the countryside? Well, I hope that you will provide the answer by considering a career in public service. To those talented young men already deeply committed to public service, the seminar students of the State Department's Foreign Service School, a word about the difficulty of change. So I urge you to remember that Americans often grow impatient when they cannot see light at the end of the tunnel, when policies do not overnight usher in a new order. But politics is not magic. And when some of our fellow citizens despair of the tedium and the time necessary to bring change, as for example in Vietnam today, I believe they really forget our history. But there is, I deeply believe, a very rising tide of good sense in the world and a growing determination to get on with the constructive tasks that are ahead of us. And that is why in the whole art, from Tehran to Tokyo and Seoul, we are working with the governments and with the peoples of free Asia as they seek increased development and increased regional cohesion. And that is why with our Latin American friends, we're constantly seeking ways to accelerate the Alliance for Progress. An hour and a half after he had finished addressing the Foreign Service School graduates, President Johnson welcomed President Rene Schick of Nicaragua to Washington. It is always good, Mr. President, when the heads of governments can come together. Each of us, each day, constantly face new challenges. We here in the United States, for example, are now engaged in a great battle to eliminate the last elements of racial discrimination in this society of ours. Mr. President, we're trying so hard to improve our entire educational system in this country. Because in every society, education is the ultimate basis for responsible citizenship for economic growth, for social progress. We are very much determined to keep our land beautiful in the face of an industrial civilization which threatens the landscape and the air and the water. Americans in pursuit of progress have made a monumental hash of their landscape. They have defiled the earth, polluted the waterways, fouled the air, and very nearly destroyed a nation's scenic splendors. Planners and conservationists had long preached the conquest of ugliness, but it had taken a dedicated first lady to bring this crusade to all American. Philadelphia, June 10th. Mrs. Johnson arrived to accept the second annual Society Hill Medal for her personal contribution to the beautification program of America's major cities, and for her recognition of the Society Hill area itself as a unique renewal area in the United States. Once, President Johnson had held firm in the administration's conduct of the war in Vietnam. 
He had held firm despite a mounting barrage of criticism and a rising uneasiness over the war as reflected in public opinion polls. Now the firmness was beginning to pay off. Despite all the gloomy headlines, the political situation in Saigon was not without hope. The September 11th elections, which might well put Vietnam on the long road to representative government, were less than three months away. United States troops were continuing to inflict the kind of losses that no enemy could sustain indefinitely. There were telling signs of a weakening morale in North Vietnam. But now, against this background of weakening morale, a sudden shift had begun to develop in Hanoi's conduct of the war. Round-the-clock surveillance of the Ho Chi Minh Trail had revealed a feverishly increased infiltration rate of men and materiel from the north. New roads to the south were being built. An estimated number of 15,000 trucks had been shipped into North Vietnam by their allies. Large numbers of motorized barges were busy hauling war material down the country's maze of inland waterways. What it boiled down to was that the Reds were shifting from a small arms guerrilla action to a quasi-conventional military war. Truck and barge convoys obviously could not travel without oil. Oil which North Vietnam did not produce or refine oil which was being imported at an increased rate of 60% over recent months, oil which Hanoi was now hurriedly trying to disperse and bury. Given the perishable nature of such a target, it was now becoming expedient to bomb the huge oil tank complexes outside the cities of Hanoi and Haiphong. On the evening of June 13th, the Supreme Court paid tribute as its venerable old building became a backdrop for the reception of Lucy Baines Johnson of Washington, D.C. and her fiancé, Patrick John Nugent of Waukegan, Illinois. It was the first such reception to ever be held there. By August 6, 1966, Lucy would become the eighth daughter of a president to marry while her father was in office. The following evening, the President and Mrs. Johnson honored the foreign ambassadors to the United Nations with a White House reception. Washington was to be the first step on a grand tour of the United States, planned and arranged by American Ambassador Arthur Goldberg. Oddly enough, more than half of these UN members had never seen this nation's capital. As he stood in the reception line, President Johnson had good reason for optimism about the state of the world in June of 1966. Despite French instigated tremors within NATO, Europe not only had become more stable than at any time since World War II, but it was full of movements hinting at political improvements and innovations to come. In Asia, nine free countries were meeting in Korea to form a loose but friendly association that would have been impossible only a year before. And despite all the debate about American intervention in the Dominican Republic to head off a potential communist takeover, that country was now amply vindicating that intervention with peaceful free elections. On Wednesday morning of June 15th, the East Room was filled with some of the country's most prominent hospital and medical leaders. The countdown to Medicare had already begun. By July 1st, it would be an actuality. With its implementation would come the greatest single contribution to the well-being of older citizens since the launching of Social Security. There would be many problems at first, some revolving around compliance with the Civil Rights Act. Medicare would also add to the patient load. There would be those who would demand excessive treatment for minor illnesses, and there would always be the danger of escalating prices for both hospital and medical services.
Washington is no place to uh, patrol matters in 50 states. The further you get away from the community, the less efficient you are and the more expensive you are. So we hope that at the local level this can be done. Now, we think that these abuses, that you can watch after them better than anyone else. And we want to help you in any way that you think we can help. That same morning, President Johnson met with a delegation of over 20 Austrian leaders and businessmen who were touring the United States. His message of greeting would concern itself with the remarkable post-war history of Austria and its economic recovery following World War II. But there was another message here, one that applied not only to Austria, but also to the pressing problem of Vietnam. And we learned that Reconciliation does not always come quickly. But we also learn that if we are patient and sustain our commitments, and if we maintain our efforts, and if we are sure and certain of our principles, but willing always to negotiate as reasonable men, then fair and just solutions can usually be found. On the morning of the 16th, he would hit at the problem again. This time as he spoke before a conference of state legislative leaders who had assembled in Washington to discuss the growing problem of state and federal relationships. So when you come in here today, in this period of time when we are trying to guarantee not only our Bill of Rights, but our rights to good health and our rights to education and our rights to be free and our rights to enjoy ourselves and raise our families in good environments and our rights to liberty and freedom, it means we cannot have those rights unless we try to help other people preserve them too. But we cannot tell what the days ahead hold for us. We know they're going to be difficult. We know they're going to require sacrifice. Everything we've ever done in our history to preserve freedom has required it. We're fighting for a hundred nations' freedom and liberty. And we're going to continue to fight until men are convinced that it's better to talk than to fight. For days, his inner clock had been telling him that the time had come to press home the Allied military advantage to the hilt. The decision had become nearly inevitable. We were winning the ground war, but American casualties for the past month had been high, too high. As a responsible commander, he could no longer overlook the natural logistical bases like the oil fields of Hanoi and Haiphong. During this entire period, my advisors and I have almost on a daily basis continued closely to examine and to carefully scrutinize what the aggressor has been doing and what our course of action should be. We have examined the alternatives open to us, including every suggestion from those who have not always shared our views. The decision to bomb and its agonizing alternatives would have to be weighed in the face of many intricate and diverse webs of opposition. But after all the meetings, after all the conferences, after all the evidences, facts, and figures were in, the final action would hinge upon the convictions of one man. He and he alone would have to exercise the lonely mandate given him by the American people. Even his most trusted advisors would not be privy to that final moment when the decision itself had to be made. The bombing of the oil fields at Hanoi and Haiphong was set for June 24th.
break in the tension came on June 21st with the Washington arrival of Saudi Arabia's legendary King Faisal. Majesty, Alanwa Salan, though the pronunciation of that traditional Arabic greeting may not be fully correct, the warmth of the welcome it conveys is very real and sincere. We have long looked forward to Your Majesty's visit. We are greatly honored and very pleased to have you here today at the White House as our guest. I know that you're no stranger to our country. You first came to the United States in 1943 as the guest then of President Franklin D. Roosevelt at a time when we were deep in a global war to turn back aggression. I am sure that you've sensed even in those dark days the dedication of this country and its people to the defense of human rights, to the dignity of the individual, and to the freedom and independence of all countries. Since those stirring days, you have visited our country many times and in various capacities. These visits have, I am sure, given you a deep insight into our problems as well as our efforts to surmount those problems. They have also given us the opportunity to draw upon your wisdom and to learn from you. As the venerable Arabic say, saying has it, our house is your house. Once again, I extend to you on behalf of all the American people a hearty welcome to our land.
president's order to bomb the oil fields of Hanoi and Haiphong had been given, given with a tacit understanding that the actual commission of the act was still contingent on his last minute approval. During the days following King Faisal's departure, as he reviewed and re-reviewed the alternatives in his mind, President Johnson maintained a busy schedule. He signed the Bail Reform Act and presented to Lieutenant Charles Williams of the Army Special Forces the nation's highest award for valor, the Medal of Honor. Then on June 24th, the raid was canceled. It appeared certain that bad flying weather over the targets and a news leak to the press had altered the schedule. The 24th was the day that the president met with the recipients of the Young American Medal, Jeffrey Gallagher, John Hanchess, and a delightfully reticent young man named David Crow. On the morning of December 2nd, 1964, David, who was then six years old, had rescued his three younger sisters from their burning home. After warning the girls to stay put, he had gone off in the sub-freezing weather to find his mother, who had taken her two older children to school. David Eugene Crow of Cherokee, Kansas, a young boy who had, in Shakespeare's words, borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing in the figure of a lamb the feats of a lion. By Monday the 27th, the bombing had been rescheduled. As the time for the strike approached, President Johnson seemed to be everywhere at once, prodding his aides to a faster pace, churning through appointments, and yet somehow finding the time to put in an appearance at a conference on beautification and a state commission's meeting on the status of women. Seldom has a military operation been more meticulously prepared. There were no Russian tankers visiting Haiphong. All Allied governments with troops in Vietnam had been consulted, and all others advised. The Navy pilots that hit the oil fields of Haiphong from the carrier USS Ranger, like the Air Force pilots who went in on Hanoi, were members of the first team. All had close to over 100 combat missions. And all of them had been hand-picked for their knowledge of the terrain and their ability to get the bombs where they belonged, on target. When it was over, 80% of the two oil complexes had been destroyed, and 50% of North Vietnam's petroleum, oil, and lubricant supplies had gone up in smoke. The United States forces had lost one plane. Near mid-afternoon on June 29th, Australia's Prime Minister, Harold Holt, arrived in Washington. Throughout the morning, news of the bombings had brought the expected cries of escalation from President Johnson's critics. Against this background of criticism and uncertain developments, Prime Minister Holt gave vent to the feelings of his country. Mr. President, 
You know that in Australia you have an understanding friend. I am here, sir, not asking for anything. An experience which I'm sure you value uh, at times when uh, uh, it is not uh, so frequent uh, as it might be. You have in us not merely an understanding friend, but one staunch in the belief of the need for our presence with you in Vietnam. We are not there because of our friendship. We are there because, like you, we believe it is right to be there. And so, sir, in uh, the lonelier and uh, perhaps uh, uh, even more disheartening moments which come to any national leader, I hope uh, there will be a corner of your mind and heart which takes cheer from the fact that you have an admiring friend, a staunch friend, that will be all the way with LBJ. On the 30th of June, President Johnson headed toward the Midwest and a whirlwind trip through the cities of Omaha, Nebraska, and Des Moines, Iowa. Undoubtedly, the words of Prime Minister Harold Holt were still fresh in his memory. He had needed those words. But the elixir of President Johnson's political life has always been found in the people. His need to be among them, to talk to them, to see them face to face and to sense their reactions. The needs of a president to go out again among the men and the women and the children whose servant he is. To be refreshed once more by America's deep confidence in itself, by its conviction that we don't have any problem that we're not big enough to solve ourselves. He had come to the Midwest not only to challenge the critics of his administration's farm policy and bolster the fortunes of his political party, but to talk about the needs of the world and the value of the commitment in Vietnam. At Omaha's city dock. This afternoon in Omaha, at the end of a very important lifeline, at the other end of that lifeline, 8,000 long miles out yonder, is India. India, a nation of 500 million human beings. The wheat here this afternoon is part of their shield against the catastrophe of drought and famine. Now, these are only beginning. We must work for a global effort. South Vietnam has asked us for help. Only if we abandon our respect for the rights of other people could we turn down their plea. No one knows how long it will take. None can tell you how much sacrifice it will take. No one can tell you how costly it will be. But I can, I do here and now tell you this. The aggression that they're conducting will not succeed. By early afternoon, President Johnson had arrived in Iowa. Now, on the last leg of his journey, the trip into Des Moines, the president's caravan stopped off at the small farming community of Indianola. The unfinished economic business in America is for us to make a place at the table of our abundance for our brothers and for our countrymen. And who is it that can look out here into the Iowa countryside that I saw today and say that we cannot make such a place. There are a few voices in the air who tell the Midwest farmer that he has to beware. 
They are saying that someone over there in Washington is out to deprive him of his fair share of the nation's prosperity. They tried to divide farmers from consumers, but they never remind you that farmers are consumers too. No industry has more consumers of goods and services than the great basic industry of agriculture. I know that Iowans who for generations have offered their skill and their human concern to less fortunate people will not hesitate to do so again. And that is why I am here to tell you tonight that the only wise policy to follow in Vietnam is the policy that has worked so successfully for two decades. We just must be patient, but we must be firm. If we run or we quit the fight, if we abandon our effort to keep stability in Asia, every single nation there will once again be an easy prey for these hungry, yearning, communist appetites. So we are using our power in Vietnam because the communists have given us no other choice, no other alternative, no other substitute. We have repeated and repeated and repeated time and time again in a hundred nations or more that we desire to discuss peace at the conference table. But let me make this absolutely clear. I want the leaders of North Vietnam to know exactly where we stand. As long as they persist in their aggression against South Vietnam, America will resist that aggression. As long as they carry the battle to South Vietnam and try to conquer by conquest, as long as they carry on this war, which they have started, America will persevere. Just after midnight on June the 30th, President Johnson came home to Texas. The journey to the Midwest, the journey through the month of June 1966, was over.